Boa tarde a todos. Eu sou o Christian Viteiro, PRH 50.1, pesquisador visitante. Hoje nós temos o 25º webinar do PRH 50.1. Eu também aqui também comigo o pós-doc do nosso programa, Gustavo Chacon, que vai me ajudar aqui na, na organização do webinar. É, é um prazer ter aqui com, com a gente o pesquisador Gonçalo Prieto, do Instituto de Tecnologia Química uh, da Universidade Politécnica de Valência, na Espanha. Então, o, o doutor Gonçalo Prieto, ele fez o seu, a sua graduação em Engenharia Química na Universidade de, de Oviedo, tendo feito logo o seu doutorado em Química na Universidade Politécnica de Valência, recebendo um prêmio nacional uh, pela Sociedade Espanhola de Catálise, uh, e ele se graduou em 2010, terminou o doutorado em 2010. Depois, ele foi realizar seu estágio pós-doutoral na Universidade de Utrecht, na Holanda, e teve uma, um período de como visitante na Universidade de Louisiana, nos Estados Unidos. Logo, ele foi para se moveu para o Max Planck, na, na Alemanha, onde em 2015 ele se tornou grupo líder no, no departamento de catálise heterogênea. Em 2018, ele aceitou uma posição como tenure track, no Instituto de Tecnologia Química, com essa posição no CSIC, e moveu, então, o seu grupo do Max Planck para o Instituto de Tecnologia Química. Os seus interesses uh, na pesquisa estão focados na catálise heterogênea, para a conversão seletiva de moléculas pequenas, como metano e alcanos, al alcenos leves, CO2, CO, no gás de síntese, para valorização de de matérias-primas alternativas ao petróleo em commodities uh, químicos né, e combustíveis. O seu grupo usa uma variedade de métodos, tá, incluindo técnicas de luz síncrota, espectroscopias, uh, técnicas uh, 3D de tomografia, acopladas a, margem, a mar, imagens quantitativas uh, de análise, tá, e para fundamentalmente entender e racionalizar o desenho de novos materiais catalíticos. O doutor Prieto, então, ele é autor de mais de 50 artigos em periódicos de alto impacto, como, por exemplo, Nature Materials, Nature Communications, né, Event Checks, ACS Catalysis, Journal of Catalysis, com mais de 100 citações por paper, e possui sete capítulos de livro. Uh, além do mais, a sua, a sua pesquisa levou até então ao pedido de sete patentes, sendo três delas transferidas à indústria. O doutor Prieto, ele administra ou administrou mais de uh, 20 projetos uh, financiados pela, por órgãos governa governamentais em três diferentes países, incluindo o prestigioso uh, ERC Consolidator, Consolidator Grant da European Research Council e projetos de pesquisa e desenvolvimento com, com parceiros industriais. Ele é atualmente o coordenador do Horizon Europe Research Consortium uh, e Tender, Uh, no qual desenvolve novos uh, rotas catalíticas híbridas para uh, combustíveis a partir de carbono neutro. Tá? Então, Gonçalo, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, we have uh, in our audience a lot of students, and as well we have uh, senior researchers. So uh, You have the word. It is my pleasure, Christian. Uh, I really appreciate your invitation, um, and and uh, I, I hope to, to enjoy the the next hour or so with all you, the the, the Brazilian uh, scientific community, catalysis community in particular. So my pleasure to 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 present uh, this webinar. Uh, I, I appreciate the invitation. Let me just try to to share my my screen probably is the easiest if i just shared screen is that is that visible to you yeah yes okay uh, all right so again thanks for the intro uh, christian uh my pleasure and i i have prepared a lecture 
where I would like to to discuss the the potential which uh, I feel a single atom catalysis may have in particular when it comes to functionalizing olefins in, in chemical processes. Single atom catalysis is, is a, at the moment a blooming research sub area in our uh, in our field and one of the particular applications where I feel that the potential can be uh, uh, notably uh, high and impactful is the area of, of uh, olefin functionalization. But since I know that there are, there are students uh, in the audience, uh, let me just briefly introduce this concept, single atom catalysis, for those who might not have been in contact with that yet. Although, as I said, it is becoming very, very popular in, in catalysis research. Single atom catalysis is... is Gonzalo, uh, just a moment. I believe uh, it's not full screen. Maybe you can try to to share uh, the full the full screen instead of I, these slides. I am sharing the full screen. We are seeing your uh, PowerPoint. Maybe you can try the other option. Wait a second. Um, because normally so we have two options the full screen and only the slides yes so i was i was sharing full screen so let's go now for slides and see okay So you, you could not see it in presentation mode, I understand, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. And right now, I have already uploaded, but I'm not sure if... No, it's, it's not transmitting. It's, it says processing. It's it, it, oh, okay. may, it, it may be a heavy presentation because there's there are no videos in there, but there are a number of mm -hmm. images. Not sure. Hmm. It says processing. I, I really, I'm really sorry. Ah, okay. Okay. Now, now we have okay. it. It's we perfect. It. Okay. And can you still use the pointer? Can you still see my pointer or you can't? You probably can't uh, anymore, right? No, no, no. Problem. no problem. No problem. No problem. Okay. Right. Thank you. <laughs> so as I was saying, just a very brief intro to the concept of, of tandem, of uh, single atom catalysis. Um, in single atom catalysis, the focus is in, in understanding the structural and the catalytic performance, the catalytic properties of metals when they are supported, when they are dispersed on a support material, on a carrier material, to the limit of atomic dispersion. So going from uh, the classical nanoparticles down to smaller metal clusters, few atoms there, coordinated to each other and all the way to the point where every single supported metal atom has no coordination to a, an, an atom, um, another atom of the same metal within the first at least two coordination shells. That's the limit of uh, single atom um, dispersion and, sing and that's where single atom catalysis focuses. But it's, it's not sufficient to, to to remain with that picture when we are doing research in single atom catalysis, we need to go beyond that and have into consideration that there are different local um, uh, coordination environments uh, where we can stabilize this isolated metal center. Uh, and we need to keep in mind also that depending on these different local coordination environments, the electronic, steric and 
therefore catalytic properties of our isolated metal centers might change. It might be also that a single metal center goes along different local coordination environments just in the context of a single turnover, so in the in the context of its catalytic uh, uh, action. So we it is important for researchers doing uh, uh, research in this single atom catalysis uh, area to develop tools that enable us to tell apart different local coordinations for the isolated atoms from, from one another and therefore be able to depict our isolated metal centers with um, uh, greater uh, precision. As I said at the very beginning, single atom catalysis is becoming a very blooming research sub area, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's brand new. Actually, we can track back the um, interest within the scientific community in the catalytic properties of isolated metal centers back to Taylor himself, one of the parents of, of catalysis. Already in the 20s, Taylor was interested in understanding the Difference, the, the different properties that uh, very low coordination metal uh, atoms uh, on the surface of metallic surfaces, on the on the yeah topmost surface of, of metallic particles or single crystals could have, and he was already hypothesizing at that time that um, for these extremely low coordination uh, metal centers, they might make so many bonds to reactants that at some point they might detach and, and perform, behave as independent, as disconnected from the rest of the metallic network, which would be like the first idea uh, of a single atom uh, catalyst. Later down, but already in the 70s, for instance, work uh, of Köp and, and co-workers in, in Germany, they were already deliberately supporting and stabilizing isolated metal atoms on carrier materials and investigating with with high precision differences in in the way these isolated metal centers absorb and dissociate hydrogen compared to agglomerates so clusters or nanoparticles where there is direct metal to metal coordination so we are not talking about a new research field but it has a renewed momentum, that's true. And one of the main reasons for that is that um, we have now at hand analytical techniques, such as, for instance, X-ray uh, absorption spectroscopy, which delivers information about local coordinations, such as aberration corrected electron microscopy, which enables direct visualization of uh, materials, even atom by atom. And that's that's one of the reasons why this, uh, this area is now going through a renewed um, uh, momentum. But this, this blooming in, 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 in this research field should not be understood, should not be taken as, a, at least that's not my intention to pass this message, that um, single atoms are the preferred active centers for catalysis in general. It is true that it is with, with, with atomic dispersion, we achieve the highest possible exposure of the metal we are um, aiming to use as a catalyst uh, to our reactants in the liquid or gas phase which surrounds our solids. That is true. Exposure is maximum. But this doesn't mean that performance is at its best with single atom catalysts. This is something that several researchers have illustrated. For instance, Avelino Kormans, so the, the, the founder of our institute and his team, show that uh, quite conclusively for a number of different reactions where clusters and nanoparticles actually are more effective than the isolated metal centers. Uh, so in, indeed for reactions where there is need to have several, uh, several metal centers cooperating in a single active site, then isolation is certainly suboptimal. We could also show that for CO oxidation catalysis on uh, different metals, 4D and 5D transition metals supported on magnesium. It was clear that once the catalyst had undergone uh, reductive agglomeration and then uh, clusters and nanoparticles had developed on the catalyst, uh, the light of temperature, so 
was reduced and therefore the activity was increased. So another example where aggregates, metal aggregates, were more effective as a catalyst than the isolated metal centers themselves. But my I, idea today was to highlight the potential that I feel this single atom catalyst may have in the particular area of uh, olefin functionalization. Olefins are essential platform chemicals uh, in, in today's chemical industry. They are typically produced by conventional petrochemical processes, such as naphtha reforming, fluid catalytic cracking, FCC, then in this case followed typically by ethylene uh, oligomerization to, to produce longer chains, so-called higher um, olefins. They can also be accessed uh, from unconventional raw materials, such as natural shale gas, biomass, even waste CO2. In this case, via other type of process based on uh, the fissure crop synthesis, so using syn gas as an intermediate, or dehydration of bioalcohols, for instance. And then depending on their uh, molecular weight and the, the, the chain length of their hydrocarbon backbone, these olefins uh, act as, as excellent uh, uh, commodities at the entry point of, of different uh, uh, value chains of the chemical industry. And quite often, olefin valorization involves olefin functionalization. You can see there, there in, in this summary of different routes through which alkenes or olefins can be uh, valorized nowadays. And in most cases, it the, the routes include adding functionality um, to, to the um, hydrocarbon, to the starting hydrocarbon. It can be oxygen to produce aldehyde or alcohol derivatives, for instance. It can be silicon to produce organozelanes, um, nitrogen to produce amines or nitriles, sulfur to produce organo uh, tiles and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, the market size for processes around olefin functionalization is at, at present huge. And it is a realm which is traditionally uh, dominated by homogeneous catalysis. So the area where the, the catalysts are applied are molecular catalysts operating in solution. Catalyst which bear a uh, well-defined and monoatomic metal center on the figure here on the right hand side is a cobalt center the the electronic aesthetic and therefore catalytic properties of which we can sort of tune to some extent by selecting the the nature of the organic ligands which are directly coordinated to this metal center in these coordination uh, complexes these are uh, long optimized catalysts in, in the industry at present, and they are capable of uh, uh, driving, uh, for instance, oxidative addition and reductive elimination steps to and from the metal center, which are typically key in, in mechanisms involved in, in olefin uh, uh, functionalization. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's an important feature of these optimized catalysts, they are also capable of inhibiting the thermodynamically most favored but less desired side reaction of olefin hydrogenation to the corresponding paraffin because the paraffin would have a way lower added value than the starting olefin in the first place. So that's another very important feature that we should be able to mimic if we are aiming to produce analogs of this molecular catalyst but now in solid state. <coughs> If we now take uh, these considerations alone and, and we try to translate them in, in, into heterogeneous catalysis, that's the area where we are active and, and, and it's the area which tries to develop all solid, so exclusively solid catalysts that are uh, able to drive these reactions as selectively as possible. Then, um, then one, one immediately may think about isolated metal center, single atom catalyst as um, potentially suitable candidates for olefin uh, functionalization. <clears throat> it, is, it is quite well known, it has been reported here on the right-hand side, I show an example based on palladium catalyst, that uh, the lack of direct 
metal metal coordination and let alone extended metal surfaces such as those which might be present in, in clusters and, and especially nanoparticles inhibits <clears throat> the olefin pi coordination to to the metal that as i show here on the left hand side is a sort of a prerequisite for olefin hydrogenation reactions catalyzed by metals indeed single atom catalysts are known to show outstanding up to full selectivity in um, alkyne semi-hydrogenation processes, selectivity to the alkene intermediate product by inhibiting very effectively further hydrogenation to the alkane side product. As you can see here, olefins, so the, the alkene uh, uh, intermediate product, bind way less strongly to single atoms than they do to extended metal surfaces in nanoparticles and clusters, which are those catalyzing the, this undesired further hydrogenation of the alkene to alkanes with orders of magnitude higher uh, turnover frequencies or so reaction rate per unit metal center compared to the isolated metal sensor. So that isolated metal sensors are not very effective in, in yeah, pi coordinating, activating olefins and in, in, in at the same time, activating hydrogen to insert into um, alkyl me metal bones and therefore drive and desire uh, premature hydrogenation, which is something to certainly avoid when the goal is to functionalize your olefin. So based on these considerations, we, um, in our team, we, we have run a, a number of uh, research uh, programs in the area of olefin functionalization of the, of the last few years. And, and how do we prepare our single atom catalyst first? Well, we do that most often by relying on concepts such as oxidative redispersion, which is also an old concept. It, it has been applied in industry for decades to redisperse supported metal catalysts that had undergone deactivation uh, due to metal sintering and agglomeration. And we combine those oxidative redispersion phenomena to oxide supports, which have the capability to capture and stabilize cationic, mononuclear cationic species at high temperatures and under oxidative conditions. So in a nutshell, how does that go? If you look at the uh, uh, mid row in, in, in our cartoon, the synthesis goes by first depositing a, a metal precursor, which, I, which is depicted in orange, darker orange, on the surface of an oxide material, which is the support, is the yellow material. Then if we apply typical uh, conventional thermal activation treatments, such as calcination at relatively mild temperatures, typically below 500 degrees C is enough, then what, would, what we do is to decompose our metal precursor, and typically this leads to um, metal oxide crystallites. For some metals, even already metallic crystallites supported on the oxide material. But if we move on and, and we, we apply a uh, treatments at higher temperatures under these oxidative atmospheres, then the metal oxide crystallites become unstable. They disrupt into monoatomic oxo species, which are very mobile at the high temperatures, and they migrate on the surface. They find their way to anchoring sites on the surface of the oxide support. And this leads to isolated metal centers at these anchoring sites. That's the um, STM micrograph that I'm showing on, on the right-hand side and the top. You can see there as bright speckles, those isolated metal centers supported uh, on the uh, crystalline, in this case, oxide uh, support material. Actually, the trapping of these metal species by the oxide support lowers the surface energy of the whole system. And it actually prevents the sintering of the support itself to the point at which, which could have happened uh, should we uh, treat this support without any additional metal at these very high temperatures, uh, very high annealing temperatures. That's what I'm showing in the top side of, of my cartoon. That's the sintering which would have happened if there are no monoatomic metal species uh, being trapped and therefore reducing the surface energy of the whole system. This stabilization of uh, single atoms happens to a certain 
limit. And the limit comes uh, dictated by the saturation of the anchoring sites of the support and the surplus of metal that we try to disperse in there will end up probably, in most cases, agglomerated and forming oxide clusters or nanoparticles. That's the bottom part of the cartoon and the, the bottom micrograph on the right-hand side. Indeed, this saturation point beyond which um, stabilizing a monatomic species is no longer possible, at least in our hands and for the series of all different 4D and 5D transition metals we have dispersed on a number of different oxides, uh, it happens at around one to two metal atoms per square nanometer. That's what this plateauing, uh, this leveling off of the specific surface area versus the metal content is telling us. Beyond there, then the specific surface area is no longer increasing, meaning that we have reached the maximum stabilization that we could have. And that translates into the fact that all anchoring sites on the oxide support have been uh, saturated. Beyond those contents, then, metal agglomeration sets in. We're going to have trouble now <clears throat> To interpret this, this uh, now I'm realizing that we are going to have trouble to interpret this uh, and other slides because of the lack of animation when I'm sharing the slides rather than sharing the presentation itself. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'll try my best. Because, yeah, there, there were quite a number of animations here to show to to showcase what I'm what I'm saying, but. What I try to convey here is the, the different degrees of freedom we've got as scientists when we are designing a single atom catalyst. The first and most obvious degrees of freedom, degree of freedom is the nature of the metal that we are dispersing atomically in the first place. By changing the nature of that metal, we can change electronic properties. We can change also the preferred local coordination structure. Can be oct uh, octahedral, can also be planar, square planar. We can change that by selecting different metals. Second degree of, of uh, design relates to the oxide support itself, where we can isomorphically substitute those cations which are uh, intrinsic to the oxide support by a different ones. And this way, we are introducing Lewis acid centers close to our atomically dispersed metal with different acid strengths. That's what I represented by substituting one of the uh, green atoms by this purple atom there. We, we, the, those are cations and we are changing the Lewis acidity in the neighborhood of our uh, supported metal. The third possibility is to design our oxide material, our support, as to its propensity to create vacant sites in the direct coordination environment of our metal. Typically, oxygen vacancies, for instance. That's something that we can also consider and we can engineer to some extent in our, in our catalysts. And that those can play an important role uh, in, in single atom catalysis, where very seldomly, if, if at all possible, uh, the whole catalytic cycle would be run by the single metal center without participation of uh, some of the metal centers, either Lewis centers or oxygen vacancies and so on, in the in the direct neighborhood of it. So with that brief introduction to what is the topic, what, what is the topic of uh, single atom catalysis, what may be the significance of it, um, and what degrees of freedom do we have to design this type of catalyst? I wanted to I, I I want to illustrate that with two showcases today from our own work. The first showcase involves um, oxo functionalization of uh, olefins uh, through uh, hydroformulation chemistry, and the second showcase involves the synthesis of um, organocelanes, which is selectively terminal organocelanes from uh, higher olefins, um, again using single atom catalysis. So let's go for the first showcase. Um, the first showcase discusses ethylene hydroformylation. Hydroformylation is a very important, well-established industrial process to oxo-functionalize olefins of different chain lengths into oxygenates. They are, they are C plus one aldehyde derivative. 
if we are, uh, and, and this happens by reaction of the olefin with syncase, so carbon monoxide and hydrogen. If we are starting from ethylene, for instance, very light, the, the shortest possible olefin, then we would produce propionaldehyde, so propanol as the hydroformulation product. Propanol is a, is a very interesting platform chemical. Uh, it is the precursor, for instance, for uh, propionic acid, acrylic acid, and, and resins thereof. So, so it's an interesting component on its own. But beyond oxofunctionalization, the hydroformulation of uh, light olefins, such as ethylene, also propylene, uh, can also be regarded as a potential reactive separation process, alternative to the state-of-the-art cryogenic distillation processes, which are used nowadays to recover this type of olefins, very uh, high volatility olefins, such as, as I said, ethylene, also propylene, from mixtures with the corresponding uh, alkanes. Um, Let's discuss, for instance, the, the, the case of ethylene, which is going to be the, the showcase to, to discuss later on in the presentation. Um, when the goal is to separate <clears throat> um, ethylene from mixtures with propylene or mixtures with lower value ethane, then one faces the problem that the boiling points for the two C2 compounds, olefine and paraffin, are very low and very similar to one another. So you can see here, on the right hand side, those boiling points are in the ballpark of minus 90 degrees C in both cases. But the, and, and this imposes cryogenic conditions to separate those molecules uh, by distillation. And that entails very high energy costs and therefore economic costs too. Operation OPEX costs. costs. Just take a look at the a very high energy cost to, to recover one ton of ethylene. It's about eight gigajoules of energy per ton of ethylene recovered by cryogenic distillation. This is indeed one of the most energy intensive processes now, known nowadays in the chemical industry. But on the contrary, as you can see on the plot too, the boiling point for propanol, that's the product of um, ethylene hydroformulation, is 150 degrees C higher than, uh, than, than uh, the boiling point of either the paraffin or the, the starting olefin. Meaning that separating, recovering propanol from mixtures with, uh, for instance, ethane, which would behave as inert and be unconverted through a hydroformulation process, could be energetically very undemanding and therefore less costly. So that's also a potential application of this oxofunctionalization reaction. Well, ethylene hydroformulation is a well-known and well-established process, but in the liquid phase, in the liquid phase and with molecular catalyst in solution, typically based on rhodium carbonyl complexes stabilized by different organic ligands. Organophosphines are one of the most common. <clears throat> However, for very volatile, eh? very low boiling point olefins, such as ethylene, also propylene, then developing a alternative process, which is capable of operating in the gas phase and with solid catalysts, it's, it's certainly attached to a number of technical incentives uh, related to uh, process intensification and OPEX savings, for sure. Uh, but this, this Gas phase uh, selective hydroformulation process for ethylene has long remained like a, a, a untractable challenge in, in the area of continuous catalysis with solids, I would say. The closest we've gotten there is using the, the type of catalyst that I'm showing on the right hand side of this slide, which is which are microscopically solid but microscopically liquid. Because they are the so-called supported ionic liquid phase type of catalyst where a very thin a nanometer thick um, ionic liquid uh, film with essentially no vapor pressure is um, supported, dispersed on a porous carrier and acts as the solvent for, uh, for just molecular catalysts like the ones I was showing on the left-hand side. Essentially, the same catalyst 
which would operate in the solvent, in a conventional solvent, in a homogeneous catalysis process. This is the closest we've gotten to a selective ethylene hydroformylation with we're using solid catalysts at least until, uh, I would say, a month ago or, or a month and a half ago. <clears throat> what is the problem of um, of solid catalysts? Because there, there, they have been, there has been research on all solid, all inorganic catalysts for ethylene hydroformylation in the gas phase for decades and decades. And, uh, but the major problem is that uh, in, in, in all cases, they also trigger to some extent this undesired ethylene hydro hydrogenation to ethane as a side product. Uh, so that's that's one of the long-standing challenges with solid catalysts. And that's, that was the reason why they, they traditionally uh, uh, could not match performance of those molecular counterparts in, in liquid media. At the beginning of this project, we set out to investigate one of these um, uh, degrees of design for single atom catalysts, uh, which was in particular the, our capacity to generate oxygen vacancies and in, in the vicinity of our single metal atoms. Because um, already in, in, in other technologies, such as sensing, for instance, for for light olefins, which is uh, important in a different in different technologies, sensors rely on on this uh, interaction between um, olefins and and oxygen vacancies, uh, the, those type of surface effects, and that, that was the rationale we had at the beginning of this project. So we decided to take a look at um, how energetically easy or difficult it is to create surface oxygen vacancies on different oxides so that we could make a selection of target support materials for our catalyst. And this is what I'm showing here on this plot at, in the center of the slide. I'm ordering a number of different oxides in terms of how easy it is to generate oxygen vacancies on their surface. So this is essentially the oxygen vacancy formation energy. And we decided to uh, concentrate on three examples that span the whole range of energies. So from tin oxide, quite on the right hand side, so quite easily to generate oxygen vacancies, all the way to zirconia on the left hand side of the plot. So very unreduced, very difficult to reduce oxide, very difficult to generate oxygen vacancies in that oxide. And Encidia, which is uh, an oxide of intermediate behavior, and we we prepare rhodium-based single atom catalysts on on those on those three supports uh, to start with. On the right hand side, I'm showing you the um, aeration corrected uh, STM microras for a couple of these uh, oxide solids, just to illustrate that um, one should not worry if microscopy is not a suitable technique for to investigate your single atom catalysts. Uh, simply because the set contrast of your oxide support is even higher than that of the isolated metal centers. Now, nowadays, STM, so high angle annular dark field detectors, they rely on set numbers, typically to a power of 1.7, 1.8 or so. And, and the set number determines whether we are able to visualize or not uh, the isolated metal centers. We are able to do that um, on, on zirconia, we are si simply not able to do that on, on tin oxide. But this doesn't mean that this is not atomically dispersed. It doesn't mean either that we cannot use uh, complementary techniques, which are actually, uh, which have a much higher sampling and therefore they are more representative of the bulk of the sample than electron microscopy to assess um, atomic dispersion. This is the case, for instance, of X ray absorption spectroscopy. Uh, which is commonly used as a technique to investigate atomicity for this type of, of supported metal catalysts. Uh, what one would typically look at is, is that the Fourier transform of the exhaust uh, reaching of the spectrum, compare it to uh, some references materials. In this case, I'm showing uh, metallic rhodium and rhodium oxide bulk both at the bottom and then for different single atom catalysts on the top. And then one could just look at the uh, absence of uh, moduli signals at radial distances beyond the first coordination shell, which is 
which, which in this case could be rhodium to oxygen. That's the peak showing at around 1.6 Armstrong's phase and corrected distance. And if there is no further features, one would say, okay, there is no um, additional rhodium atoms in second or uh, farther distance coordination shells. This is typically, I have to say, insufficient to claim single atom dispersion. And in some cases, it's even impossible. Look at, for instance, at the extra spectra, the, the green one for the rhodium single atom on tin oxide. There are very clear uh, moduli signals uh, at radial distances far beyond the uh, rhodium oxygen first coordination shell. And this is due to the fact that uh, due to the, the crystalline um, symmetry of the oxides, in some cases, we, we are going to have constructive interference uh, effects at second shell and farther distance shell coordination shells, which are not associated to rhodium atoms, but may be associated to uh, cationic centers on, on the support itself. And it's, it is not trivial to, to tell whether in there or not there is information about rhodium oxoaggregates or even rhodium to rhodium coordination in, in, in nanoclasters. It is very important in catalysis to rule out the presence, together with your isolated metal centers, the presence of any other metal entity with higher nuclearity. Because in catalysis, a minority of your surface species may account for the majority of your catalytic conversion. So that's that's where uh, the, the challenge uh, stands. So that's why it is um, particularly a healthy exercise, I would say, in, in research in catalysis to, to develop uh, computational models, for instance, using periodic DFT uh, methods relax them, optimize them energetically, and use them as the basis to simulate, uh, for instance, exaf data, and be able to investigate not only the first coordination shell, but farther distant coordination shells around your uh, element of, of interest. And this is something that we have done regularly in our last publications. And here I would like to, to thank a, a collaboration, a longstanding collaboration with uh, uh, Giovanni Agostini uh, from, from the, the cells, uh, the Alba cells synchrotron in Spain, also Carlo Marini, those are responsible. Um, so those are scientists at uh, Notos and, and Kleist beam lines. And I have been cooperating specifically with Giovanni, even from, from the times where my group was still based in, in Germany. So what, what do we do is to generate using um, periodic uh, DFT, different site models, trying to probe uh, different local coordination environments for the metal center we are interested in. In this case, it's rhodium on tin oxide. We can generate it for a rhodium isomorphically substituted on, a, on different uh, tin oxide facets. We can uh, model also rhodium in subsurface position, so uh, that has migrated into the bulk and so on. And we can then do the fittings to generate all the scattering data for all the scattering paths from the models and do fittings to our experimental data. Because as I said, in many instances, the lack of um, high radial distance um, modular sickness is not sufficient to claim um, that single atoms are the one and only um, species on your material. And in some cases, there is a lot of information in, in, um, in, in the frequency, in the K space. So there are shifts in there that need to be interpreted because they are informative as to whether uh, the site you have in mind is representative of what uh, predominates in your material or not. For instance, in this case, there is an excellent fit for this rhodium center isomorphically substituting a tin 4 plus cation on, on the, the most stable 100 facet of tin oxide. But then when you place it in the bulk, the fitting is worse. Actually, it's a, non, it's a physically non-sensible fit in the sense that uh, some of the uh, fitting parameters, the, the free parameters take values which have no 
physical meaning. For instance, a the buy water factor which is too high or or negative. So that's a way of discriminating centers. And we, we it is important to do this for quite a number of different site models and combining um, scattering paths from different models just to check if perhaps a single atom uh, a, a, a single rolling atom uh, substituted at a specific position on a specific facet of tin oxide does describe your experimental data, but the combination of that with few low nuclearity um, clusters provides an even better fit, suggesting that you may have a, a two populations of of species, and then this is already a warning for anyone doing catalysis because once you have to two different species, you need to figure out very carefully which one is responsible for, for catalysis. So we did that to ensure that all these single atom catalysts I'm going to discuss here, they did show a monotomic protein dispersion on the different oxides. And then under industrially relevant conditions for ethylene hydroformylation catalysis, all these um, oxide supported single atom uh, catalysts showed activity. This is what I'm showing in the in, in, on the left-hand side plot, the bar plot. As you can see there, catalysts supported on zirconia and ceria, they showed modest activities, turnover frequencies. That's the, uh, the dash bars. And also modest selectivities around about 60% to hydroformulation. That's the, the full bars. But we were very delighted to see that under the very same conditions, rhodium single atom stabilized on tin oxide, they showed orders of magnitude, note the um, uh, logarithmic scale in the y-axis, orders, two orders of magnitude higher react, reaction rate per unit center than those supported on zirconia and Syria. Very interestingly, together with selectivities to higher formulation above 95% at this temperature, this is data at 150 degrees C, but we could improve that selectivity to essentially 98, 99% by operating a slightly milder temperature. So we were very positively sur surprised on the one side and intrigued on the other, on the other, on the other hand, uh, by the performance of this single atom catalyst. And this is why we decided to first of all do a temperature screening to see how this catalyst behaves at different operation temperatures. This is what I'm showing on the right-hand side as a function of the time on stream, so the reaction time. You can see that at quite mild reaction temperatures, around about 110 degrees C, this catalyst can show a remarkable turnover frequency, it's essentially full selectivity, and quite good stability. But then as we keep on increasing the uh, operation temperature, and especially when we do that beyond 150 degrees C, then the catalyst starts to lose activity at a very fast pace, and a pace that increases monotonically with increasing the operation temperature, to the point that if we go beyond 200 degrees C in operation temperature, then the catalyst is only active for a few minutes. So, very nice system very active selective quite sensitive to the operation temperature so we initially thought is this related to metal sintering or is rhodium agglomerating at these higher temperatures and that is what is killing the active centers and the answer was no no this is these results show um, um x-ray absorption spectroscopy again so they they show the uh, exact spectra both in Fourier transform as well as in the case space for at different operation temperatures under operation operandi conditions so the catalyst is being um, exposed to, to to the higher formulation uh, gas composition which is uh, ecumolar in co hydrogen and and ethylene and believe me that we did all uh, our homework, we did our fits, and there is there absolutely no sign for rhodium rhodium direct coordination. So rhodium is not agglomerating into clusters under these reaction conditions. That is not the reason for the activation. What we did observe was a decrease in the um, coordination number of rhodium to oxygen in the first shell, 
especially when we were increasing the reaction temperature below uh, beyond 150 degrees C or so. That's the point where the activation started to be more severe. So we actually thought then that the oxygen surface chemistry of the tin oxide support could be responsible for both the unique catalytic performance of the system as well as its sensitivity um, to uh, the operational temperature in terms of stability. And that's why we concentrated on investigating a little bit this surface oxygen chemistry on tin oxide, on which, by the way, there is already quite a number of, uh, qu quite a number of uh, research, quite, quite a lot of research done already. Why? Because tin oxide is one of the preferred oxides in the area of sensing light uh, molecules. And there, the oxygen chemistry of the surface of tin oxide plays an, an essential role. So we decided to go for a, a complementary a theoretical and experimental study on, on, on this oxygen surface chemistry. <clears throat> on the computational side, we use uh, periodic DFT modeling that's in cooperation with um, our colleagues in KAT, uh, Felix Stude and, and Philip Fleso, already long cooperations from back in the times where I was based in, in, in Germany. And we concentrated on this 110 tin oxide surface, which is the most stable and therefore the one which is predominantly exposed on the relatively low surface area of catalyst that we are dealing with. This catalyst has a three square meters per gram surface area. So we're talking about pretty sinter tin oxide and therefore uh, quite stable crystallite morphologies. There are two different types of, of, of surface oxygens uh, exposed on that, on that facet. The, on, on, on the, on the um, scheme that I'm showing on the left-hand side, those are marked as green and, and yellow, respectively. The first type of oxygens, two atoms in the unit cell that I'm showing there, are so-called bridging oxygen type, a bridging oxygen. Whereas the other four, labeled three to six, they are so-called in-plane oxygens. So we first computed what was the um, thermodynamic stability of those surface oxygens in the reaction atmosphere that is pertaining to the hydroformulation chemistry, which is in the presence of syngas. Hydrogen is a reducing agent, but CO is much more reducing than hydrogen. So indeed, the, um, the reaction of the two first, the bridging type of oxygens with CO to produce CO2 and then leave the... the, the, the the oxide surface is downhill energetically, and it is subjected to essentially barrierless uh, steps from the kinetic point of view. So both thermodynamic and kinetics tells us that uh, losing those bridging uh, oxygen uh, on the surface of tin oxide is energetically and kinetically very easy um, under the hydroformulation reaction conditions, even under mild reaction conditions we are applying for this process. But then, Losing further oxygen, the, the, then trying to lose the first in-plane oxygen becomes uphill energetically, as I'm showing here on the plot for oxygen vacancy number three. It goes uphill. And it is also subject to um, energy barriers, which um, would make it less feasible, if at all feasible, under the higher formulation conditions we operate this catalyst at. This is something that we could actually confirm experimentally using uh, in situ Raman spectroscopy, um, we could in, in indeed see very clearly the fingerprints for oxygen vacancies associated to the loss of this bridging type of oxygens, oxygen one and two. We could never see in, in, in the temperature regime, which is relevant for our catalytic applications, any fingerprint for in playing oxygen vacancies, meaning that um, the loss of this type of in-playing oxygen is insignificant compared to the loss of uh, bridging the type of oxygen under reaction conditions. Again, here we were benefiting from the um, bulk of information that exists on tin oxide in other scientific areas, such as sensing, where surface oxygen vacancies are essential ingredients for functionality. So what we concluded from all this investigation was that 
it was very easy to lose bridging type of uh, surface oxygen on these materials. Much easier on tin oxide than it would be on, on Syria and certainly on zirconia where generating oxygen vacancies on surface is energetically very, very demanding. And actually the, the part of this lattice oxygen delegates the rhodium atom to some extent. So it is the rhodium atom which is also losing ligands and to have a average coordination number of around four under reaction conditions. Um, a coordination, experimental coordination number that we interpreted this way. Um, on the left-hand side, we were proposing a resting type of active center where rhodium has indeed a four, effectively a four coordination number to two oxygen lattice, only two oxygen lattice, uh, lattice oxygen, sorry, on the tin oxide support plus two CO molecules. This is a dicarbonyl, but it's a, a, actually a, a hydride dicarbonyl as, as we could confirm with the IR spectroscopy. So only this species and not the, the hydride free dicarbonyl matches the vibrational uh, information we were getting um, after in situ reaction in, in an FDAR cell. This is a rhodium with, with a unusually high coordination flexibility. Uh, thanks to this loss of oxygen ligands. And it's, it's, it's coordination wise so flexible that it, it can engage quite easily in a conventional heck breslow type of reaction mechanism. That's the mechanism which is more consensed uh, for molecular complexes in solution. The, and, and the mechanism goes as, as that, bear with me, along the cycle from two to seven. So from two, the, uh, to, to create two actually, uh, this coordination flexible um, metal center can lose one of the CO ligands energetically relatively easy. Actually, that's, that's, that's one of the keys for this mechanism. And this is something that also happens, but not with CO ligands, but rather with phosphine ligands in homogeneous catalysts or so molecular catalysts uh, following this mechanism in solution. Then ethylene absorption in three, ethylene insertion into the rhodium hydride bond in four, further CO coordination and migratory insertion into the ethyl rhodium group to lead to species in six, then it's just hydrogenation and reductive elimination from seven to produce propanol and close the cycle. The highest energy barrier for this mechanism is indeed in step three to four, that's the insertion of ethylene into the rhodium hydride bond, and it's subject to just 90 kilojoules per mole uh, free energy uh, barrier, as I'm showing on the diagram in the, on the right-hand side. And that actually explains why this type of centers could be so active uh, under mild reaction conditions for ethylene hydroformylation. Then should this mechanism now depart to perform the competitive and undesired olefin hydrogenation, so ethylene hydrogenation to ethane, then that departure could happen in between steps four and five where instead of coordinating CO, the mechanism would, would need hydrogen to be coordinated and inserted into the rhodium ethyl group to perform full hydrogenation into ethane. That's the undesired reaction. And we could compute that for this center. And again, thanks to the um, uh, freedom that rhodium has, that this little uh, binding of rhodium to the oxide support, this uh, hydrogen insertion is subjected to energy barriers at least 50 to 60 kilojoules per mole higher than the CO insertion itself. Again, in line with the very high selectivity that we are observing experimentally for this type of catalyst to hydroformylation, very effectively inhibiting the um, thermodynamically more favored hydrogenation of the olefin to, to ethane. So I think this, this, is, this is illustrating in a way how oxygen uh, liability and the gaining of coordination flexibility for uh, uh, oxide-supported single atom centers can approximate their, their mechanistic uh, um, routes to those of the molecular counterparts operating in solution and therefore be a, perhaps a potential way to bring 
performances for solid catalysts close to those of the optimized molecular catalysts in homogeneous catalysis. So where does the performance of this system stand in terms of the um, state of the art for um, ethylene hydroformylation in the gas phase? And this is what I'm showing here. And again, I, I regret not having the possibility of having a, animations now to guide you through but so it becomes a bit busy now but bear with uh, what i'm showing here is is reaction rates per unit rodian center so the tof to our frequencies on the x-axis growing uh, to the right and uh, in in logarithmic scale and then on the y-axis i'm showing just the hydro, the selectivity to hydroformulation as opposed to undesired hydrogenation <clears throat> The all solid catalysts that have been investigated to date, uh, and those are the ones encaged in the yellow uh, block, they show modest reaction rates, as you can see. And also, perhaps more remarkably, especially for those which are most active, so they are on the right hand side of that yellow block, they show also limited selectivities to higher formulation, typically below 70%, because they also trigger and desire olefin hydrogenation. Now, the rhodium oxide single atom catalyst we developed, those are the, the green dots and the green shaded area. They outperform by a lot these materials, these previous solid catalysts, by bringing selectivity to essentially 100%, and not at the expense of turnover frequency, but rather improving turnover frequency orders of magnitude too. Actually, this is a performance with which places them in part to those of, uh, of the molecular hydroformylation catalysts operating in liquid media, either in solvent media, so the classical homogeneous uh, catalysis, that's the block, the data points within the pink block. Those are the most active and essentially fully selective. And also in part to, 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 to those homogeneous catalysts operating in another type of liquid media, which could be this supported ionic liquids we, we discussed before. So that's a, a very interesting performance, which opens some prospects for a very selective gas phase hydroformulation of ethylene. For completeness, I have to add, the, and this is a, a data point that I added uh, today for this presentation, because it, it is not part of this published plot, the, the red triangle dot there, because uh, essentially in parallel to the uh, revision of our of our manuscript, I think that both manuscripts were reviewed at the same time and they came out essentially at the same time over the last month. Um, the group of Philip Christopher at uh, UC Santa Barbara, they developed also this uh, so-called dual site rhodium tungsten uh, catalyst on alumina, which is also a fully inorganic catalyst and that also delivers close to full selectivity for this for this process at slightly lower uh, turnover frequencies than, than the rhodium single atom on, on tin oxide. But I just added these data points. It, it's a bit funny that a long-standing uh, challenge of for heterogeneous catalysis uh, and during decades, such as the development of a fully selective ethylene hydroformulation in the gas phase with solid, with all solid uh, catalysts, um, got two solutions to the same problem uh, within one month or so this year. So that's fun. that's something that I, I, I found uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, funny, so to say. So this with this, I wrap up uh, the first part of my lecture and, and very briefly go to, to discuss the second showcase, which, as I explained before, it um, deals with the uh, with the uh, silicon functionalization of olefins to produce organocelian compounds. And in particular, it uses the concept of tandem catalysis. For those of you which might not be familiar with tandem catalysis, it is simply the combination, the integration of two different catalysts, which are individually active and very specific for two different reactions, which are mechanistically decoupled from one another. And integrating them, as I said, to perform those two reactions in a sequential manner in a single reaction pot, so in a single reactor, and under the very same set of operation conditions. This is what I illustrate here by 
Catalyst 1 and Catalyst 2 uh, cooperating together. Tandem catalysis has a number of benefits, such as, for instance, uh, the fact that we are avoiding the need to uh, isolate and purify intermediate products in between different uh, conversion steps that saves uh, energy and cost. Uh, it may even improve the selectivity and even the safety of some processes when a very reactive or even unstable intermediate product, which is produced by a first reaction, is processed in situ on the second catalyst very shortly after it forms, so reducing its average resistance time in the reaction medium. And, and, and tandem catalysis can, may also help us overcome thermodynamic bonds to the yields or uh, reversible reactions whenever we are able to engage one of the products of the reversible reaction into a subsequent irreversible uh, steps in, in situ. So the Chatelier principle, we are just pulling the um, the equilibrium towards the, the final products. The, this concept of tandem catalysis originates in the field of homogeneous catalysis back in the 80s. Uh, researchers were combining different molecular catalysts, organo organometallic catalysts, in one single pot to steer two sequential and mechanistically decoupled reactions in, in one pot, as I said. And short after, they realized that uh, researchers in general, I'm talking about researchers in general, realized that um, a certain degree of compartmentalization of each of these two catalysts so that the direct interactions and contacts between the two, which typically brings undesired and deactivating phenomena such as ligand exchange or agglomeration, uh, even neutralization in some cases, if we are dealing with basic and acid catalysts and so on, it was beneficial. So compartmentalizing them was beneficial and that's something that uh, in the initial papers dealing with tandem catalysis was achieved by engaging each of the catalysts in different um, compartments which were still permeable to reactants and products so that the two could exchange reactants and products without enabling direct contact between the two catalysts. This was, for instance, using dendrimer vesicles, using micelles, um, and, and so on to, to, to keep the, the, the two catalysts away from each other. But if, if we now think of this, um, this situation where two mononuclear metal, well-defined metal centers are compartmentalized on two non-contacted uh, uh, compartments, then at least in my view, the direct translation of that into the area of solid catalysis, so heterogeneous catalysis could be something like that. So that's again, two mononuclear metal centers, that's the yellow and the right one, well-defined, not as well-defined as the molecular counterparts, but as well-defined as, as they can be being a uh, solid, and supported on two solid matrices, which by definition will be non-contacting if we, even if we disperse them and we steer them together in a liquid reaction medium. So this is again uh, the, the, the solid analog to the previous situation, well-defined centers, compartmentalized in non-contacting matrices. With the additional uh, benefit that single atom catalysis is the closest we can get to the high reaction specificity and selectivity of, of, of molecular catalysis. So those are the perfect ingredients to try to set up tandem uh, processes based on single atom catalysts. That's why I think that this is another uh, research subfield where uh, single atom catalysis might be um, uh, productive, the area of tandem catalysis. And in particular, as I said, I want to showcase this potential for this process, the process of silicon functionalizing olefins with uh, organo C lanes to produce alkyl organo C lanes. Uh, these are very important uh, chemicals uh, as precursors, for instance, for tensioactive compounds, surface modifiers, um, even silicones. And this is a process which is dominated, like, like hydroformulation, by homogeneous catalysis. Homogeneous catalysis with uh, complex uh, organometallic complexes, like the one I'm showing here on the, 
uh, on the top right side. This is a, a platinum. Uh, um, this is a platinum catalyst with this type of siloxane organic uh, ligands. That's uh, that's a classical hydroformylation catalyst. Very active in liquid phase. Very selective. Very very selective, but not so stable. So they they are prone to decompose into, for instance, colloidal platinum um, particles, which then contaminate the organocylane products, giving them nasty colors and, of course, co contributing to uh, a net metal loss uh, from the reactor, uh, a loss which, in the case of a metal like platinum, one should not handle uh, at industrial scale. So again, the idea was to try to find an alternative to this system based on single atom catalysts. And that's why we, we decided to synthesize now, not catalysts based on one single metal dispersed on atomically on different oxides, but on the contrary, different metals, platinum, rhodium, ruthenium, dispersed atomically in all cases on a common support material, Syria in this case. And again, you need to trust me, in view of time, I cannot discuss the results more in detail, but you need to trust me that we did everything that we had to do to confirm this, the monoatomicity of these metal centers, at least at this uh, close to one atom per, per square nanometer surface metal content on, on Syria for all different uh, metals. And then we went to test their performance for this reaction. And we started off with a one octane. This is the reaction I'm showing on the top of the slide. One octane hydrocylylation with ethyl, three ethyl silane. There are three major products that can be produced under these reaction conditions. First is the desired one, organocylane. Well, we can have there the desired terminal, that's the most valuable product, the desired terminal silane, uh, where the silicon is substituting the, the hydrocarbon chain at the end. That's the anti Markovnikov radioselective uh, product. But we, we can also have the Markovnikov one, where uh, there is a, a methyl substitute and then there is a branch chain for our, our organocylane. But those are the, the desired products, organocylanes. Then there is the possibility to have just olefin isomerization, double bond migration, to have internal olefins from the terminal starting olefin. That's the product I depict as two, internal olefins in color purple. And finally, we, one can have this premature hydrogenation of the olefin, the undesired one, um, the most undesired one to produce octane in this case. Then how do these three single atom catalysts behave? Well, we started testing platinum because platinum is the benchmark catalyst for this, um, this hydrocylation chemistry in homogeneous catalysis. And platinum was active for both um, hydrocylation and olefin double bone migration, as you can see here, to some extent also to hydrogenation. But we were very happy to see that uh, a rhodium-based single atom catalyst was extremely selective to the anti-Markovnikov hydrocylylation of the terminal olefin to produce the terminal organocylane with very little olefin isomerization. And on the contrary, we were also quite surprised to see that ruthenium was very selective to perform olefin double bone migration, isomerization, was inactive, was not capable of inserting silicon, was not capable of running hydrocylylation. On the platinum catalyst, these two reactions compete on the same active center. On the rhodium and ruthenium catalyst, these two, these two reactions are decoupled on two different catalysts. It's a perfect situation for a tandem integration of the two. We could actually track back one, uh, uh, the reasons for this specific uh, difference in, in the behavior of rhodium and ruthenium using um, um, uh, in situ spectroscopy and, and again, DFT modeling. And the, the reason for that was tracked to the very different, so the, the quite um, uh, high difference in energy barriers above uh, 35 kilojoules per mole difference for the um, for the, the, the rate determining step of olefin isomerization, double bone migration, which is actually dictated, it's a barrier, uh, uh, as I show with the full arrows on the plot, 
it is dominated by the absorption energy of the olefin on different centers, ruthenium or rhodium, which is what I show by the dot, by the dashed, sorry, arrows on the plot. So the, the olefin binds much stronger to ruthenium than to rhodium single centers, and that determines that on ruthenium, the preferred pathway is to uh, um, uh, move to, 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 to isomerize the olefin into internal olefins, whereas in, on rhodium, the preferred pathway is to activate the C lane, co-activate the C lane and insert it uh, to produce organo C lane. So that was something, this reaction specificity offered by these two catalysts, that was something that triggered us to, to try the, the tandem integration of the two. And as you can see here on the left-hand side, if we combine those two single atom catalysts in one single pot so that one is responsible for olefin double bond migration and the other one is responsible for uh, this regioselective hydroxylation, they show much higher organo C lane yield than either of the two separately, even than the a, a benchmark molecular platinum karstedt catalyst under the same conditions, or combinations of ruthenium for, with platinum which is active for those two reactions. That's already an, um, an example or a, a result, which is exemplifying that decoupling the two reactions on two independent sites might be preferred to let them compete on the same site where the uh, resistance time of the substrate on site might be way less effective if the two reaction pathways are competing. In this case, this is the case for platinum single atom catalyst. We could go on. By the way, this, this is converting already an internal olefin. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure why the, the, the reaction is not showing on the top, but here we move from converting a terminal olefin to already converted to optin. And that one, that's why it was necessary to combine olefin double bond migration activity to bring the double bond to the end of the chain, plus this regioselective functionalization with C lane, with the C lane. If we move even to a farther internal in the uh, olefin substrate to a more challenging substrate such as 3-octene which is what I'm showing here on the on the right hand side then we can very clearly see the synergism between the two single atoms when combined in tandem. Ruthenium and rhodium independently they are very poorly active on their own but then at the optimal catalyst ratio between the two that comes from the uh, ratio of catalysts that uh, brings very close in, in value the reaction rates for isomerization and for uh, hydrocellulation, then the yield to the um, uh, organocylanes and the selectivity to the terminal product as compared to the branch, that's the terminal is the green part of the bar, the branch is the red part of the branch, is very high. Even starting from a, uh, such a challenging internal olefin as a starting uh, reactant, such as 3-octane. So, and this is my last slide, this, this triggers us to, to try this, this tandem system in a relevant and tough, I would say, a feedstock. That's a, a industrial mixture of internal and terminal olefins, in this case, C8 to C10 olefins, which was very kindly provided by uh, Shell. That's what they call the neodine uh, products. That those are olefin mixtures which come from uh, metathesis upgrading of um, um, ethylene oligomerization processes through the, the so-called SHOP, uh, so higher olefin uh, process uh, patented and operated by Shell. These are relatively low value mixtures because of the uh, coexistence of a uh, number of internal and terminal olefins. And our tunnel system could handle that. And by a combination of these double bone migration plus very rigid selective uh, uh, hydrocellulation, convert them selectively to the terminal organo C lanes. As I said, as I show here, with a 96% selectivity to the terminal organo C lane compared to only four to the branch one. And with that, I come to, to, the, to the end of my talk. I just would like to wrap up by emphasizing that, um, in my view at least, single atom catalysis holds a lot of uh, potential to, uh, to develop new processes for selective olefin functionalization now operated with all solid catalysts, so fully inorganic catalysts. That's an area which is traditionally dominated by homogeneous catalysis.
that the and I, I hope I was able to illustrate that with two uh, showcases. First one where the oxygen liability on on the oxide support, in this case tin oxide, was a critical design parameter for a single atom catalyst. In this case, to 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 be unusually selective uh, in the gas phase hydroformulation of ethylene. And in the second showcase, um, I was illustrating that single atom catalysts are also excellent platforms due to their uh, higher reaction specificity and selectivity compared to catalysts where different type of metals uh, metal sites are exposed on the surface, typically those based on nanoparticles. And so those features are particularly appealing in the area of tandem catalysis. Um, and I, I hope I was able to illustrate that with this tandem olefin isomerization hydrocellulation process to produce uh, terminal organocylanes with high region selectivities, even for complex from complex mixtures of internal and terminal starting olefins. And with that, I'm not sure why the picture of the team is not showing on screen. Um, maybe, maybe I can switch to share screen now that the presentation is over and without much of of technical issues, and and perhaps move to this uh, acknowledgement slide so that also the the team are on display because the first. Uh, Thing, the, the first thing that I would like to do before ending my presentation is to, to thank uh, the, the group of uh, John and, and talented and, and very uh, devoted uh, scientists that, uh, that uh, I have the privilege to mentor in their PhD and, and postdoc projects. I also would like to thank uh, all the collaborators which have contributed to this work with DFT, uh, Felix Stutt and Philip Plesso, microscopists, uh, Raul and, and, and uh, Norbert Fender, Patricia Concession, my colleague here at IDQ for the uh, work on uh, cooperation on, on uh, vibrational spectroscopy, Giovanni Agostini and Carlo Marini uh, at Alba Cells for X ray absorption spectroscopy, Shell for the provision of these uh, industrially relevant mixtures where to showcase our catalysis, the funding that supports our work, and again, everyone who has uh, logged in today for my lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo, for this uh, impressive, impressive talk. Uh, I have some questions before the audience get uh, started. Uh, about the, the, uh, the vacancies in the supports, uh, I imagine that you have a mixture of uh, chemical uh, local environments for the single atoms. How do you manage this by 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 exhaust? Because uh, from what I understood, you have uh, an optimized DFT model, and then you try to fit it. But have you tried to fit uh, a normal a normal fit? Have you tried to perform a normal fit, like with uh, current? Um, uh meta oxide paths for example what yes. is the output of the yes it works it system. works it works too the 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 coordination num the average coordination number of rhodium 2 oxygen you are going to get is slightly different because the scattering paths are not exactly the same when you're using bulk rhodium oxide as a model or a model specifically designed for rhodium bonded to to the tin oxide but you get qualitatively, you get the same trend. So you get a, this uh, decrease in the average rhodium to oxygen coordination number uh, as, as you are exposing the catalyst to increasingly high reaction temperatures. The absolute value of the coordination numbers you are going to get are different. But this okay. is again, if you limit, this is again, if you limit the, the fit to the very first coordination shell. If you're aiming to include additional coordination shells, then you cannot rely obviously on rhodium oxide pads. You need to develop ad hoc models and optimize them for your system. Mm -hmm. But uh, you do have uh, different environments or you have just... Very likely, uh, very, very likely an excess is going to average everything. Yeah, I know. Uh, so, but this is also one of the 
powers of XFs compared to more local techniques such as electromicroscopy, where the volume of material you may analyze is a, a few cubic nanometers. With XFs, you're going to get a, a full picture of how your material looks, looks like. And of course, this entails averaging the information from all different environments. Nevertheless, for a system like this with uh, three square meters uh, per gram specific surface area, uh, exposing uh, preferentially this, this uh, 100 tin oxide facet, then you can be uh, more or less sure that uh, this, is the this is the facet uh, on which mm, the large majority of your rhodium centers are being stabilized in the real material too. Mm -hmm. And my other question, uh, maybe it's too specific for the audience, but how how did you manage the the Dubai water factors for the for the in situ uh, hydroformulation? Yes, no, that that the Dubai water factor, and actually we are running studies together with Giovanni on on that too. Changes uh, changes as a function of temperature is at the end is a parameter which tries to convey an information about the thermal uh, disorder of, of your system. So what we were doing in these operandi studies was to expose the material um, for at the different increasing reaction temperatures for one hour, then cooling down every time to room temperature oh, okay. before we were collecting the XFs. So it's a very long okay. experiment that takes uh, almost two days uh, long. It's almost an entire beam time. But you ensure that you are collecting XFs data only at room temperature, then you can uh, you don't have to worry about different divide water factors at different temperatures. Okay, yeah. perfect. So we have some some questions here in the audience that we will uh, project it for you. Uh, I don't know if you are going to see the questions. Maybe if you remove the presentation, I think we can read. But if you if you're anyway going to read them, I think we can keep the presentation on ah. in, ca in case okay. we need to. To, to go to some of the slides Perfect. to address any of those. Okay, we have a question from Francine Bertella. Thank you for the amazing presentation. Have you tried to increase the number of effects on uh, tin oxide by maybe increasing the tin oxide surface area? Uh, hi, Francine. Uh, good to, 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 to have you online. Uh, greetings from here. Uh, very pertinent, very pertinent question indeed. Very, very to the point. And this is one of the, and not 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 only a specific surface area, but but some other crystallographic parameters. This is something that we want to further investigate. Um, how can that affect uh, the performance of these materials? Yes. Uh, well, tin oxide. I have to say that tin oxide is an oxide with intrinsically low. Taman and, and Hütig temperatures that it, it, it's very easy to sinter. And the way we are synthesizing our single atom catalyst is by annealing them at high temperature. So uh, by, in, by improving the specific surface area, we might not be able to achieve terrifically high surface areas, but perhaps a slightly higher. Uh, more, than, more than a surface area, I'm, I'm, I am interested uh, also in, 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 in terminations, etc. How can that affect the way uh, rhodium atom centers uh, uh, sit and, and behave. But yes, this is something that is currently um, uh, in the pipeline. Yeah. So we have another question from Professor Andrei Kodakov. Here's he with us hey. in your audience. Hi, and Hi Andrei. So, a very nice talk. Can you comment about the stability of heterogeneous single atom catalysts? for hydroformylation compared it to the homogeneous counterparts? Again, uh, greetings to Andre, um, um, and thanks for, for attending and for the question. Uh, it is difficult to compare because then we would need to compare homogeneous counterparts in liquid media and the, head, and the heterogeneous ones, so the solid ones, in the gas phase. So that's already an unfair comparison to start with. Uh, the only thing I can say at, at the moment this is, uh, is that um, we could sustain uh, the activity in the selectivity for our system for, I think I was showing it, um, at the optimized reaction temperature, we could sustain that, you can see here, for about 90 hours on stream. That's in a lab scale um, among the longest times that we have tested the system at. Um, homogeneous catalyst in solution can be more stable than that. 
On the other hand, they cannot operate in continuous mode. You need to recover them from the mixtures with the products. You need to distillate. You need to, to apply nanofiltration or some way of recovering those catalysts and recycle them to your reactor. So again, it's a comparing uh, operational times in, in, in liquid media uh, and in, um, in gas solid catalysis is a bit unfair. This is the number that I can give for, 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 uh, for the moment. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't see, initially, I don't see a reason why this catalyst would not be equally stable, if not more stable than the liquid phase ones. Because here, leaching into the gas phase, which is also possible, one can, one can create volatile rhodium carbon species and lose them from your reactor, is energetically more demanding than losing uh, rhodium uh, in, into solution and losing it with the product. So at least there is a benefit in there, uh, but this is as much as I can say for now on this system. Okay, thanks. Another question from, from Professor Kodakov. Uh, what is the oxidation state of, sing of metals in single atom catalysts measured from Zanes? As prepared, so as soon as they have been prepared by this oxi high temperature oxid oxidative redispersion and trapping, and before we use them, so before we expose them to hydro formulation conditions, oxidation state is three, four plus. It is very difficult to differentiate between those two oxidation states for rhodium, even using XPS. So we actually assume it's four plus, and, it's, and rhodium is isomorphically substituting team four plus on tin oxide. Under reaction conditions, the mechanism involves the formation of these Di hydride dicarbonyl species with an oxidation state of one, one for rhodium. That's the classical heck breslow mechanism too. So uh, cycling from one to three. And, uh, and uh, again, using XPS, the binding energies for rhodium one in the form of a dicarbonyl is indistinguishable from rhodium three plus. So it's difficult to tell, but at least mechanistically speaking, what we are proposing is that rhodium is cycling between one and three under reaction conditions, and it is three, four, actually four plus at the beginning of the reaction. So before it has been exposed to any oxygen loss. Mm -hmm. Let me hear some background Let me noise. see forever. I'm not sure what is it coming from, but yeah, I yeah, know. it's probably from my microphone. Sorry, uh, Gustavo, do you have a question? Uh, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Gonzalo, for the excellent presentation. I would like to know about the synthesis. Uh, do you have tried uh, another way to, to produce single atoms to compare, for example, the fixed six uh, uh, methodologies like uh, large place ablation or sputtering deposition, for example? No, we haven't. Um, sputtering deposition relies on depositing me uh, metal atoms which are already metallic in nature and they typically don't bind very strongly to oxide supports if you do that and i mean friends of mine such as uh, Garrett parkinson at uh, vienna university they they've shown that they they've shown that those are more prone to uh, aggregate at weight milder reaction conditions in the presence of some reactants such as co even at room temperature then they skate on the surface there are no linkages to the to the support they skate and they form clusters uh, very fast so uh, in short, the answer is um, we have tried some, but uh, some methods, but they are all based on redispersing, disrupting, and redispersing crystallites, because we believe that only that way the bonding to the support is strong enough to so that the atoms remain isolated even under reaction conditions. If these reaction conditions are not very high temperature and very reducing. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's all. Well, thank you. Gonzalo, I have two, two more questions from... It's just out of curiosity. Uh, the first one is, is regarding the... It's just, it's just curiosity. Can you, can you consider uh, an ion exchange at zeolite? Uh, for example, if I put platinum on, on a zeolite, can I consider it a single atom as well, conceptually, or because as long generally as, the way I see it, the way I see it, as long as there is no 
uh, other platinum atom uh, uh, in the first or second second coordination shell of that platinum atom? Yes, why not? It would fit the, it, it would fit the definition which is more generalized for single atom catalysis. Mm -hmm. As long as there is a platinum uh, atom within the first, of course, and even the second coordination shell of uh, another platinum atom, then the answer would be no. What you have is a, an oxo metal cluster or a metallic cluster. Okay. Uh, then, the, nature, the nature of the support, if, if the oxide is a, is, a, is a crystalline bulk or it's a, the cavities of a zeolite, uh, that doesn't really matter. And there is plenty of excellent work by Avellino, uh, by Avellino and his team, including you, too, uh, on, on dispersing and, and, and reclustering back metals using zeolites as the, as the support. Um, it's true that on a, on a silicon matrix, the, the binding might be less strong and they, they, they might be more prone to, to aggregate than if they are isomorphically substituted on some oxides. That's true. But mm -hmm. yeah, why not? They, they, they should be called single atom as, as long as there is no additional um, metal center within the first two coordination shells. Mm -hmm. And the second question is uh, is regarding to to this. Are you doing are you doing something on, on single atom and, and zeolites or or no or just mm -hmm. uh, oxides? Not at present. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, from my from my part is okay. We have no further questions from the audience. So I would like to to thank you. For the for this uh, great presentation and for your availability, I know that uh, you have a, a really busy academic life. So thank you very much for being here with us today. My pleasure. Uh, thanks for inviting. Thanks for having thought of me to contribute and to to share a couple of time, a couple of uh, minutes with the Brazilian scientific community. It was my pleasure. It was great to see you you guys online okay thank you very much i will uh, finish the, the transmission thank you guys uh, bom pessoal muito obrigado pela presença agora nós temos na semana que vem o 26º webinar com o José Luiz Serrillo do Caos da Arábia Saudita que vai falar para a gente sobre a geração de hidrogênio a partir da amônia então eu convido a todos para estarem presentes na semana que vem E um bom resto de semana e bom final de semana para todo mundo. Tchau, tchau.